What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Denarik Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnian Reacts to Geography Now Australia this time. Okay, so if you're seeing this screen upside down, that's because I had to flip it upside down for all the uh, Australians out there so they can see it properly. But I uh, just, just give it a moment and your eyes should adjust after a while and everyone should see the video properly. Okay, should be good now. So uh, anyway, uh, as I'm recording this, the Spanish episode should, should be out on Wednesday. And the Flag Friday should be out on Friday, of course, when this video is going to be released on Friday. And I'll do the Spanish episode. Uh, I'll release it either on Saturday or Sunday. It will be released. Don't worry. No, no need to, you know, <laughs> beg me about it. It will be released. No worries about there. Okay, so anyway, uh, Geography Now Australia. I do recall Paul doing this a while ago. I forgot a lot about it. Obviously, I watched it before. This is the revised version on Geography Now Australia, of course. It's only 10 minutes long. For a major country, you'd think it would be a little longer, but apparently not. And uh, also I did uh, the Australian uh, states and territories. So uh, I won't be mentioning th that much about the states and territories and their histories because I already mentioned it before. I don't want to repeat myself. You can just check out that video on my channel if you're intrigued. But anyway, let's just get right on into Geography Now Australia. I will be putting uh, a lot of my input in the video, a lot of Australia's history and yeah, let's just go ahead and go for it. All right, everybody, let's just all get it off of our chests. Koalas. Koalas and kangaroos, boomerangs, <laughs> didgeridoos, Sydney, Melbourne, Uluru, crocodiles, cockadoos, everything that will kill you, shrimp on Barbies, that's not true, that Vegemite stuff that tastes like poo, coral reefs and platypuses, pla platypus, platypi. Those are venomous, the plural somehow. Of platypus. All right, now let's platypuses, actually learn guess, about the freaking country. It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Paul Barbato. Today's gonna be Australia. You know the drill, let's dissect the flag. The Southern Cross and the Union Jack. The Australian Jack. flag has a blue field with a Union Jack on the upper hoist corner to represent that it was a former colony and a current Commonwealth of the United Kingdom, with a large star under it representing the Commonwealth, and the five stars on the right, the Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Crucis, to the right representing the Southern Cross constellation. Mm -hmm. All right, that was... Now, these constellations that Australia sees uh, cannot be seen in the Northern Hemisphere. So like the Big Dipper, for example, the Australians probably couldn't see because they're literally looking at a different part of our galaxy uh, from their point of view. So this is, this makes the Southern Cross unique to Australia as it, it the name Australia literally just means, you know, South or Southern. Uh, it was first uh, assumed to exist by the ancient Greeks. Uh, which thought when they were looking at a map, they were noticing, hmm, there's too much land on the northern hemisphere. So there should be some more land on the southern hemisphere to balance, you know, <laughs> balance everything out. I mean, uh, OK, but <laughs> they basically uh, called this place that they assumed that existed uh, Australis Incognita. Basically means unknown southern land or ter Terra Australis Incognita unknown southern land and it was actually in the early 1600s that the dutch finally discovered said you know terra incognita and uh yeah australia was one of the last places to be discovered of the new world well technically uh, um antarctica but who, who cares about antarctica there's nothing there <laughs> so yeah technically australia and new zealand they were the final the final frontier of mankind in a sense it's fun now let's discuss about the borders it's an island. Now, obviously, as an island nation, or rather large one, but still an island, Australia doesn't have any borders with any other nations, but that doesn't mean that Australia doesn't have some rather intriguing parameters. The country divides itself up in a rather intriguing way. Like the US, Australia has states, not provinces. There is a difference. Six of them, and each and one, one kind of has their own little flair and quirks, like Tasmania, known for being crazy. Where things get a little interesting, though, are Bogan, the territories. Australia has three domestic internal territories and six overseas territories. Technically, seven if you include the Australian Antarctic Territory, even though the Antarctic Treaty kind of bans anybody from claiming Antarctic soil as their own, which we will find out in future episodes that a lot of countries do a wonderful job at ignoring. The three internal territories are Northern Territory, Capital Territory, which is basically just the capital city of Canberra and some extra space around it, and Canberra. the confusing little tyke Jervis Bay Territory. Jervis Bay was bought and developed to give the inland capital Canberra access to the sea, and eventually Jervis Bay split from the capital, however, it's actually it's still Jarvis counted as Bay, part of the capital okay. in elections it's a little confusing even though now uh, australians do have a you know a different way of pronouncing things like for example you went people would pronounce 
the, the third largest city of uh, Australia, Brisbane, because, you know, if you're looking at the end, B-A-N-E, you would assume, you know, Bane, Brisbane, but it's actually Brisbane, which was named after uh, one Scottish uh, commander in the uh, in the British army when fighting against the Napoleon, fighting alongside the Duke of Wellington. And he was uh, given a governorship of New South Wales at the time. He was only governor for like, what, four years before he was, you know, discontinued in a sense. But uh, afterwards, a penal colony was named after him, after his name, Sir Thomas Brisbane. So being that he was Scott, you would assume that, you know, their names are slightly differently pronounced than, uh, than English, true English names. So, uh, for example, it's not Belham, it's Bellum, you know, they're just an example. While the other city of people call it Melbourne or Paul called it Melbourne, that's technically incorrect in two ways. One, the British pronunciation will call it Melbourne, and obviously the Australian accent is based off of the British accent, so they call it Melbourne. But, and this is a huge but, because a lot of Australians insist that it's always pronounced Melbourne, but it can be officially also pronounced Melbourne if you're an American speaker or if you're a Canadian speaker. Obviously, I'm using an American slash Canadian accent, so I will be referring to it as Melbourne, okay? So... Melbourne. Melbourne. And also, it's, it wasn't Canberra. Like you said, it's either Canberra or Canberra. So, there. So it really doesn't have much going for it, except for a small Navy base and beaches that it kind of took from other neighboring towns. The most dramatic border area, though, would have to be the middle of Australia. For years, this slab of land didn't exactly quite know how to distinguish itself and has gone through four transitions in the past century. First, it was all South Australia, which that didn't quite make sense <laughs> because parts of it touched the northern parts of Australia. So it split into two, one state and one territory. Then for four years, it became South Australia and two territories, the new one being called Central Australian Territory. Then finally it changed its mind and went back to being Northern Territory. Central Australia is kind of like your girlfriend at a restaurant. What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple! Finally, we've reached the overseas territories. Although Australia has over 8,000 islands under its sovereignty, six of these islands operate as distinct Most territories, of Small, some of which sustain themselves with permanent populations. They are Ashmore and Cartier, the Cocos or Keelings Islands, Coral Sea Islands, the Heard and McDonald Islands, and the popular holiday spot, Can I get McDonald's there? Island, <laughs> and the pleasant Christmas Island that gets attacked by huge coconut crabs every jacks. year. Finally, Australia is home to arguably the most micronations in the world. Places like the Principality of Y, Rainbow Creek, the but Empire of Atlantium, and more. These nations were developed by either small groups of people or a single person because they were doing things like protesting taxes and wanted to claim autonomy, or they Republic were just of kind of bored and Denaria. decided to amuse themselves. <laughs> but still, hey, they tried. All right, now let's talk about the landscape, shall we? Okay, not all of Australia is a desert, okay? Only about 35%. Okay, yeah, back, so sure. besides Antarctica, Australia is the driest continent on the planet, which explains why, yes, 85% of the population lives along the edges of the country within 50 kilometers of the coast. Yeah, speaking of uh, coastline, that is where, yeah, most of the cities are just founded, besides like Canberra and a few uh, smaller inland towns. That's about it. Most people just live on the outskirts of the island of Australia. Now, initially, uh, Australia was populated by the aboriginals, but I'll get back to them later. Uh, but basically, it was on the 26th of uh, January, 1788, when the first British ships arrived near nowadays what we would call Sydney, or whatever the port of Sydney was called. I guess just the port of Sydney, Port of Jackson, I think it was something like that. I don't know. But basically, uh, that was the first ship that brought over British settlers to New South Wales, as one half of it was called, the other half was New Holland. And, uh, you know, many many people would assume most, the vast majority of them were just convicts brought over, but eh, less than half of them were actually convicts. And most, you know, the people wanting to live in Australia were just normal settlers like you would have in the United States, for example, or Canada, I guess. And you would, and most of the uh, eastern, in, eastern, uh, Coastal cities that we know nowadays, uh, such as Sydney, such as uh, Newcastle, such as uh, Melbourne or Melbourne, however you want to call it, and uh, later on Brisbane, and even Adelaide and Perth were founded as free cities. 
later on, but Perth, because it, its population wasn't really you know, increasing naturally. They, they became a penal colony as well later on. But uh, yeah, that's a different story. And fast forward that a few years and you would, you would have a lot of wars with the aboriginals. The aboriginals would get diseased, just like in the United States. A lot of them died off to, due to diseases, a lot due to the Australian frontier wars. Of course, the British won those wars, as we know nowadays. And after afterwards, you would have a gold rush in the mid-1800s. A lot of people flocked in to, you know, take advantage of that gold rush. But, you know, the Australian government, whatever was you know, governing the place was highly corrupt. People did not like it at all. And uh, afterwards, this would all, you know, culminate into the infamous, or I guess famous, Eureka Stockade, in which many, many of the, uh, you know, workers protested against the government. Afterwards, they demanded more rights, such as uh, trade unions and work unions based off of, you know, Marxism, which is still, you know, now, nowadays still kind of a thing in uh, Australia nowadays. But that was really important as the people there started to feel a, a sense of being, you know, Australian. Australian nationalism started to surge there. And I'll stop off there and I'll continue on later. A little bit more about the aboriginals and what happened later on. Nonetheless, a lot of places, specifically around the coasts, actually have very temperate and even tropical landscapes. By the north, you find yes. tropical As zones and see, wetlands and rainforests. By the far edges on the east and west, you can find subtropical zones with lighter forests and plains. A little bit inland, close to the interior, you find grasslands and flat stretches of semi-arid terrain. Savannas, In the southeast by Sydney, you find temperate, cooler, arid land with semi-tropical, yet slightly dry areas with an abundance of trees and plants. Then, of course, you have Tasmania, which is on a completely different level of green. Then we reach the deep interior where we hit the great deserts like the Great Victoria and Great Sandy Deserts. This area is famously known as the Outback. There's also the, the Outback Simpsons is essentially desert. the area of Australia with long open stretches of red and orange desert that lays out beyond the horizon with few sparse populations of people that can be found anywhere. It has a Don't dry, care. rocky, <laughs> rugged terrain that everybody assumes is teeming with a variety of poisonous insects and reptiles. Probably and, well, is. I mean, it kind of is, but still, <laughs> there's more to it than just that. Oh, and don't forget Lake Hilly that strange lake that is mysteriously naturally pink for some strange reason that might be scientists. algae now, if there's one thing that really epitomizes australia it would have to be its world-renowned beaches and coasts people flock from all over the world just to enjoy the beautiful pristine atmosphere of a real authentic australian beach just not nowadays during sunscreen. corona australians actually kind of have a joke where they can tell who the ignorant tourists are it's usually the ones who think they'll be totally fine sitting out in the i sun bet the sand would be minutes. Skin cancer rates are actually exceptionally high in Australia, and the population has acknowledged the precautions that they need to take. Now, we all know that Australia is home to some of the most unique and curiously distinct animal species True. in the world not found anywhere else. However, Australia is also known as the home of many feral species. Australia has over 50 invasive species that were brought over to the land from areas mostly in Europe, and over the course of nearly one and a half centuries have bred and spread like wildfire Breed like all rabbits. over the country. Animals like the European rabbit, red fox, water buffaloes, goats, pigs, even camels, and worst of all, the famous cane toad. They've all gone wild and have cost the Australian government billions of dollars in environmental damages and Including the yeah, emus. I don't really know how to transition into the demographics from this part, so here's demographics. <laughs> They lost the new war. <laughs> Today, Australia has a population of about 23 million people. Now, to 25. many outsiders, Australia is kind of known as the Nowadays. place where the British sent their prisoners. First of all, that's rude. Second of all, that's only like kind of half true. Yes, during the early years of Australia's colonization from the UK, droves of convicts were sent to penal colonies in Botany Bay, which is now in present day Sydney. Over 165,000 convicts, about 25,000 of which were Botany, women, okay. were sent over the course of 80 years. Although the British weren't the first ones to discover Australia, it was actually Actually, the Dutch. As they came, they named the mm -hmm. land New Holland and the adjacent island next door New Zealand after the province of Zeeland in the Netherlands. However, as we'll soon discover, the Dutch were really good at discovering places, but kind of not so good at colonizing and maintaining those places for themselves. However, most of Australia's population came from natural colonization from British non-convict nationals. Some would argue that Australia was kind of like the UK's version of Operation Backup Plan in case of America goes crazy. After the American 
American Revolution, the UK After tried to compensate the lost colonies by re-establishing new ones, and Australia was hot on the list. About 85% of the population is European. Asians make up the next largest minority of about 12%, mostly coming from China and India and other Southeast Asian countries like Vietnam and the Philippines. And by the way, yes, Australia does have black people. Not many, but before the Federation began, Africans, mostly from sub-Saharan countries like South Africa, Mauritius, Zimbabwe, and Sudan, have historically resided in Australia. It wasn't until the 60s when African assistance programs allowed many Africans to study and eventually move to Australia. And today, they make up about 1% of the population. One demographic of people that commonly gets overlooked though would have to be the native Australians, commonly known as the Aborigines, which make up about 3% of the population. Aborigines are a very unique and distinct people group that come from hundreds of different tribes, each with their own language and dialect, spread throughout the North, South, and Central regions. Today, Aboriginal rights are a huge hot button topic in Australian legislation, and about 22% of the land of Northern Australia is Aboriginal owned. Okay, regarding the Aboriginals, uh, you know, they were the autochthonous people that in initially inhabited the area of today's Australia, they passed over a land bridge that used to exist between Papua New Guinea and uh, Australia, uh, known as uh, Sahul, simply. So that's so they're mostly uh, similar to the people of Papua New Guinea, but also there were some people from the uh, Indonesian island chain that actually settled some parts of Australia as well. So it's assumed like you know Indonesia, Papua New Guinea mix, kind of. Uh, but there were only when the Dutch arrived around, it's assumed like 300,000, 700,000 of them. Obviously, you know, this place is not the easiest place to survive off of. So you wouldn't expect a lot of them. They didn't have agriculture. They didn't have a lot of things iron, I believe. <laughs> they were super primitive, even compared to like the uh, American Indians or Africans. Africans were pretty advanced compared to these guys, African tribes. So... Um, uh, and afterwards, of course, you know, they didn't enjoy people settling their land. This culminated to a lot of wars. They gained a lot of sicknesses from these wars. And uh, eventually they were you know, driven back. And uh, But they do have some land in the Northern Territory, as Paul said nowadays. But they, let's just say after Australia, and let's continue our story with Australia, uh, after this whole Eureka stockade and everything went on, a lot of these people that were freed from the, their ex-convict status started settling in areas around Australia. Some even dared tr try to settle inland of Australia, where there was very little police force and very weak governance. And what little police force there was, well, was obviously highly corrupt. And in all of this arose the Robin Hood of Australia, known as Ned Kelly, which which was wore that i'll put a you know <laughs> put a picture of him up there he wore yeah armor well, he, he was sort of like the australian outlaw of sorts so <laughs> that's an interesting story also i'm not going to explain his entire story now but definitely look it up he has a interesting story and it's like part of australian folklore nowadays and in 1901 australia became officially the commonwealth of australia and s started to govern itself now now we're coming back to the aboriginals. Let's just say they were very much uh, targeted. Um, they became known as uh, I'm not allowed. I don't, know, I don't think if I'm allowed to say it, but it might be considered rude. But they were kind of forcibly mixed with other peoples in in the hopes of you know rooting them out completely, like completely mixing genes with uh, you know Europeans and aboriginals to eventually destroy the you know aboriginal. Uh, DNA nowadays, so I'm not going to. They they had a name for it, but I'm I don't I'm not sure if YouTube will allow me to say it, so I'm not going to say it. It might be a slur nowadays, and uh, they went through that, and in uh, and afterwards, Australia during World War One answered the call to uh, join the war on the side of the Allies, and uh, they made a landing on Gallipoli. We all know the famous battle or infamous battle of Gallipoli that was being held in the Ottoman Empire near uh, near the Straits of the Dardanelles and the Australians and New Zealands attacked together and they made the Anzac or Australian New Zealander uh, Army Corps or Anzac for short. They That was a very failed landing. A lot of them ended up dying. 
but I guess it's it's sort of ingrained in the Australian nation, uh, national sense of self nowadays. So, and afterwards in World War II, the even though they were basically crippled economically by the uh, Great Depression, they joined again on the side of the Allies in World War II. And uh, some might some people might be thinking, why did they do this? Did they really need to go to war in a far flung? Area one, they were a British colony, so of course they did. <laughs> Second of all, uh, why did this carry on? Like, why did they answer the call to war in like Iraq for the United States? Well, here's the thing regarding Australian geopolitics. Uh, even though it punches well above its weight, it's still very few people, and because of that, they can't really afford a massive navy to do, to to uh, patrol all of its giant veins of trade that go all around the world because obviously you're not going to be able to make a very powerful economy from just 25 million people so you have to trade elsewhere and because they didn't have a powerful enough navy you know who did have one the british at the time that was the most powerful navy in the world uh, so they protected their trade and they will basically do what the british want them to do and afterwards you know the british are not that powerful as they used to be uh, Britannia does not rule the waves, but America does rule the waves. And Australia, you know, kind of has to go along with the flow with the, the United States as well. And yeah, also they 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 fought valiantly against the, the Japanese and were kind of tortured by them, the POWs, Australian POWs. And they the Japanese even bombarded uh, the northern cities of Australia, like Darwin specifically. So they were not completely, you know, you know, far out of this world, you know, in a, in a safe area. So even they had to, I guess, fight for their lives. In 2013, Aboriginal groups actually banded together and decided to kind of make their own little state called the Murawari Republic, independent from Australia. But it's the come Australian it. government, though, doesn't really recognize this claim. It just kind of brushes it off with a meh, as long as you don't cause a civil war attitude. Well, as you can see, a lot of people have come to live in Australia, but now let's see how Australia interacts with the rest of the world. And I guess they're pretty cool. <laughs> Australia is, let's just put it very simply, a very popular country. If this was high school, Australia would be on the top of the social ladder, hands down. Everybody knows something about Australia. When it comes to friends, though, Australia not only goes for the cool kids, but also the strategic ones. Of course, Australia gets along with many of its Asian neighbor I mean. <laughs> nations, specifically China and India, as large numbers of people That's from those a lot nations of their iron in goes. Australia. And they do great business with them as well. Australia gets along pretty well with the islands of Oceania, except Fiji. In 2006, Australia refused to back up a military coup that overthrew the government in Fiji. And since then, things have been a little weird between the two countries. In terms of their best friends though, of course, New Zealand would have to rank in the top level and they are basically Surprise. like siblings that share a very similar culture, language, and histories as former colonies. Whereas the UK also has a high priority on Australia's entourage as they make up the largest demographic of people ethnically and as migrants in the country. But finally, we reach the USA. The USA and Australia kind of have a little crush on each other. Australia is always there to back up the US in times when allies are necessary and the US, well, I mean, we Americans, we just love Australians. We love their accents. We love their culture. Especially we the love accents. Their accents. We love their spunky Australian attitude. Their accents. And we love their sexy, sexy accents. <laughs> Almost any Australian that comes to the US it, is yeah. immediately <laughs> loved and welcome, even if they are slightly sociopathic. One sentence with that accent, and we are smitten. We love sociopathic? Australia. In <laughs> conclusion, Australia is just. Says the Americans with the Australia. guns. <laughs> Stay tuned. Austria is coming up next. Austria? Uh, I don't think Austria is going to come up next because there's <laughs> already did that before and uh, it's still up on the channel. Uh, I forgot what's next. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. But expect the next revised episode coming out soon. So did I mention everything that was needed to be mentioned about Australia? Well, nowadays it's uh, one of the most prosperous nations in the world. Um, the only downside I would have to say about it is from what I heard, it's also one of the most expensive in terms of real, real estate specifically because from what i heard like uh the boomer generation of australia which is very wealthy uh after they retire they get access to their super funds as they say and they take their super funds the money they have in their super funds and they go out and buy all the real estate and rent it out leaving basically none none left for the millennial generation and i guess for the zoomers incoming generation as well and yeah, that's about it. This episode was a little longer than usual. 
But that's okay, I guess. I really wanted to explain all I could about Australia that I knew. I could I could talk about its animals as well, but you know what? You guys can search up some like documentaries on it if you guys really want to find out about Australian animals as well, which is very, you know, a popular topic, I guess, about Australia. But uh, besides that, yeah, I'll thank you all for watching and take care.